feel that a really bounty of bull. Okay. But absolutely, if somebody makes a feature request for a thing that I don't want to deal with, or is outside my wheelhouse, I would absolutely, yeah, bounties, bounties are a great idea. Um, so it's 12.09, give or take some seconds. So should I start now? Or um, so hello, uh, I'm Richard Moore. Um, I'm the author of Ethers.js. It's a Ethereum library. Um, its goals are to be complete, simple, and tiny. Um, I also tend to oversee my slides, so I might say things before the slide comes. We'll see. Um, so there's a few things I want to talk about. I just want to list like a whole bunch of random stuff. So the things that are like kind of bolder, I'll be going into more detail. Um, so I'll just go quickly over kind of major things. Um, so, for example, so it's complete. You can create wallets, you can create utilities, frameworks, and dApps. If you used um, Lime, Ether Lime, it's built on top of Ethers. Like, there's a lot of these other things. I try to expose all the internals that I use because those are often useful for tools. who are trying to kind of do like lower level things. Um, it's ready, so it's available for Node.js, TypeScript. Um, V5 has um, ES6 modules available and UMD. Um, even V4 is really ready to go in the browser. Um, tested, there's really over 20,000 test cases. Um, for me, testing is like a big thing. Uh, I don't, I use ethers for my own stuff. I don't want a mistake I made to destroy my own ether. So it's important, or CryptoKitties or any of those important things. So, uh, also it's tiny. Uh, it's creeping up slowly over time. Last year it was at 78 kilobytes. There's been a lot more stuff added. So now over the wire it's about 98 kilobytes. Once it hits 100, I'll probably start panicking and maybe start rolling back and pulling out some of the features. But part of the move for V5 is moving to a modular system using sort of Lerna. Um, it's, it's usually a lot of parts of Lerna and then has a bunch of stuff that helps manage Lerna on top of it. Um, but that way, if you just need API coding, you can let one little library in and not worry about having an entire elliptic curve topography your library. Um, lots of documentation. Again, this is something that could use more work. Talking about bounties. Anyone who wants to help, like, uh, there's lots of little things in the universe that people that aren't obvious to people about Ethereum. Like there, there needs to be some concepts included in the documentation. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, the important thing is MIT licensing. Uh, everything, including all dependencies, 100% are MIT licensed. This means that if you are some private corporation, you can take this code and not worry about something propping up in the future and you having to open source some fundamental part of your business uh, model. Um, uh, so, um, by the way, two minutes. Um, so a big dis uh, distinction between Ethers and most other libraries as they, as they are today, um, and there's a few people working with as well trying to help promote this idea, that signers and providers should be fundamentally different creatures. Um, your signer has a private key in it. It actually signs messages for you, it, it does things. Providers are, so they provide a countless information. They, ask, they let you ask for things like, what is the current block number? What does block 75 look like? Uh, the gas price. They let you send a raw transaction, but a raw transaction of it, in and of itself is kind of a countless. Um, you needed something else with the account to do that part. Um, so there's a big distinction between providers and signers. So if you're coming from Web3 Worlds, this will be one of the big pain points. Um, feel free to bug me afterwards or online or anywhere to learn more about this and my life. Strive to make everyone separate these things. Um, so basic providers, you're probably familiar with this, so JSON RPC. IPC provider, which is actually just JSON RPC over IPC. Um, most people probably don't need more than that. The Web3 Web provider's purpose is that you can if you currently have a Web3 application, you can take your Web3 provider and jam it into that provider, and it builds a Ethers provider out of it, so it becomes Ethers compatible. Um, uh, there's also one, I'm gonna explain the fallback provider in a second. The third party provider, so there's like, currently there's Etherscan if you're known with Alchemy, Cloudflare, there's been two others that have approached me since then that want to be added. Um, so I'm gonna go into like the default provider. So the default provider is a system that I consider also makes a lot of by the way, if I'm talking too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, I get carried away into my wow. Um So yes, uh, the default provider. Basically, this is the type of providers I'd like to see more promoted as well. Um, the way that, oh, I should not have my phone, it's sometimes screws up, you know. Um, we'll see, maybe. So basically, the idea of default provider is, so it's an it's a instance of a fallback provider. So if you, for example, create the default provider for Homestead, 
it'll be backed by Etherscan, Inferior, CloudSmith, or CloudFlare, NodeSmith, Alchemy. And it will actually keep a connection to all five of these. Um, connection, for lack of a better word. Um, and when you make a request for, let's say, the current block number, it will query two of them at random. And when it gets the response, it will decide, are these, if they both say block one million, you're good to go, it returns one million to you, the user, and you're done. If there's a discrepancy between them, it'll query the third and then a fourth until there's a consensus across the back ends. So this means that uh, the classic example I worry about in terms of an, oh, sorry, that was a question. Uh, no, the, the classic example I worry about in terms of an attack vector, um, so people who are familiar with TNS, you can ask, you know, what address should I send this ether to for ritmu.eth? Uh, if I was an attacker, I would just hijack Infira and make it always return the attacker's address. Every time you send ether to anyone, it goes to that person. Um, so this means you'd have to compromise two of these random uh, sources to kind of uh, compromise the system as a whole, if that makes sense. Uh, long story short, what I'm trying to say is basically, I think it's a lot safer to have providers in this way to basically back it by multiple sources. If you run your own infrastructure, you would also probably want to do this. You can have your own no, your own um, Ethereum nodes be a higher priority. So you can give, like, let's say, a weight of three. Now that means that yours is far more likely to, to matter when it comes to deciding, uh, given this call against the blockchain, here's the response. It's going to query multiple sources. It's going to give more clout to your source um, and query it first. If there's a discrepancy, which might happen in your own infrastructure, you might have been hacked, or anyone who here who's used to running their own nodes will know that sometimes they get out of sync. Um, and when they do that, it's nice that at least Infira will pick up the slack for you, or if Infira is out of sync, your node might work together with Etherscan to provide a more reliable answer. Um, so long story short, it's very easy to connect. You basically just say const provider equals ether.default provider, and you're now connected to Homestead, and you're good for whatever you need to do. It obviously supports all the major networks, right? B, Robston, Worley, Coban. Okay, so that took longer than I expected. Let's go through the next ones quicker. So signers, um, not really a lot to say. So this is the other dual to the provider. This actually has a private key in it. It's it's fairly isolated in theory. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people today use things like Geth, which conflate your signer provider. But in the future, I'd like to see more people move towards the signer. This could be a Ledger Nano signer, which is in no way whatsoever connected to your provider. Provider becomes a very conflated word as well. So maybe we need to find a better word for provider. Um, but basically, we support all the common languages uh, for BIP39. Quick note on that, all the encodings are custom encodings. This is going to sound weird and not make a lot of sense. But for people who care, maybe they care. Um, Basically, they're all ASCII 7, so there's no transmission errors for these libraries. Um, if you transmit normal things over, if you transfer UTF-8 code over a non-UTF-8 channel, you will corrupt the data, and so there's a lot of work been put into that to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, uh, one other key note I want to point out, so this is like a PSA that I want more people to do. Um, a lot of people in their wallets, they kind of skip security. Um, so memory-based, Cryptography, in order to encrypt something and for it to be safe, it has to take a while. Making it faster makes it less secure. So if you want 10 seconds of work, people usually forgo that and just put no encryption on it because it's, no one, everyone hates it when they log into their, their wallet and the UI freezes for 10 seconds while it's like unlocking your wallet. Um, so PSA, or suggestion I guess, better than PSA. Um, Put a progress bar. Like people see a progress bar going, duh, 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 duh. it makes them feel better. When it says the word decrypting underneath it or securing your funds underneath it, people are far more willing to wait those 10 seconds. And so you just need to trick the user into accepting the fact that you're trying to make them more secure. Um, so yes, that's that connection lost exactly. Um, right, I'm trying to move Okay, 12 minutes. So ENS is a first class system. ENS. I always explain that I think ENS is like the most important thing in the entire blockchain space, not just Ethereum. Like, there's so many problems in how the internet works today. You have to trust every CA, otherwise you're compromised. Um, so ENS solves all these problems. So ENS is a first class citizen in Ethers. It always has been since like version two, and it was really dialed up in version three, and since then it's carried on. 
So, for example, you can use tapuip.e, which is one of our contracts, as the address for the contract. When you instantiate this, it'll look it up. The cool thing is, when we upgrade our, our contract, we just upgrade ENS, and all of our software continues to work. We don't have to change anything. There's no redeploying stuff other than the contract. It just works. Um, obviously, anywhere, it, long story short, anywhere in Ethers you can use an address, uh, you can use a DNS name. Uh, examples, examples, examples. So, yes. Um, deploying a contract, I didn't really plan what I was going to say about this, um, but basically, uh, you create a contract factory which allows you to create a contract. The important thing in Ethers is how a, so a signer's send transaction does not return to you a transaction hash. It returns to you the full transaction, which means that once you've done this step, so keep in mind that at this point, the contract has not been mined, but you have available to you a full contract object with the contract address. So if you had some sort of uh, database you wanted to track this in, maybe uh, the gas price is gonna like surge. You want to keep track of what transactions you've sent to the network, whether transaction IDs work, maybe you need to like bump up the gas price later in the event that it's not actually getting. Um, so you have access to all information before the contract is even on the network, and then you can do this last step to actually wait for it to be there. Obviously, if you send a message to your contract before it's deployed, other things aren't going to work. Um, you won't be happy camper, so you still have to wait for it to be um, deployed before you call stuff. But it does mean you can do stuff in the meantime. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, so this is more like low-level things watch you can do for um, contracts. Um, so normally you can do contract dot transfer, whatever your function name is, you just call it. Um, sometimes you want deferred signing. You may want to, for example, one of the signers I provide is an offline signer. Um, what this does is when you sign a transaction, it just shows up on the screen as a QR code. So this is what I run on my Atom, my little like cheap, you know, hundred dollar laptop. It's I've had the the Network card and Bluetooth has all been very aggressively removed. There's no antennas left in the machine, so I can now sign all my transactions on that machine. It pops up with a QR code, which I scan, takes me on my phone, it takes me to a website which submits the transaction to the network, and so I have a, a nice air gap solution. Um, static calls, again, most of these things are probably familiar to people who use them. If you're not familiar with them, you probably don't care too much about them. But this allows you, this is the equal to a dot call on a transaction in Web3. It lets you use an ETH underscore call instead of a send transaction um, just to simulate what might happen. It's important to realize there's a lot of consistency things in blockchain in general. You can't rely on this to be what's going to actually happen, but it can help give you clues if maybe something comes through. You can kind of get maybe error messages or that sort of thing. Um, estimate just gives you the gas price that's expected by the network for something to cost. And last is what you're used to. Ah, okay. Let me just it left. E, just two. Okay, so ABIs. So one of the things I introduced a few years ago was a human readable ABI. Um, it probably looks familiar. It looks like a solidity signature um, because it is. Uh, that's literally all it is. The important thing to realize is that solidity happens to be machine readable, um, but it's also fairly human readable. And so we might as well just use the Solidity signature instead of this craziness. And I've also omitted a lot of things, so it would fit in the slide. Um, so basically, I'm trying to push this type of format. It also means you can look at your source code and kind of tell what's going on because you see your ABI. You know that it has a transfer function and a balance of function and this sort of thing. This is very hard, and this is usually stored in a separate JSON file. You kind of get lost as what's going on. Um, so the important thing is all these tools for conversion between human readable, JSON, and sig hash, this is how you compute topics and the first four bytes uh, when you're computing the signature for function call. Um, so you can convert in between all these formats by using the fragment. You pull in a, a JSON and you can have it spit out a, you know, the full or whatever. These are useful tools if you just need to like, like, transform or even parse Solidity signatures. Um, that and I think we're getting close. ABI v2, seven minutes left. Um, so ABI v2 for people who aren't familiar, um, I introduced this two years introduced this two years ago in Ethers.js. Um, basically, 
the, by default, the Solidity does not enable you to have arrays of dynamic objects, and it does not allow you to expose structs outside of a contract. They are all actually supported. You just need a special flag to tell the Solidity compiler not to throw warnings. Um, they're very useful when you have complex objects um, to pass in and out of functions. Basically, uh, maybe self-explanatory. Again, maybe bug me afterwards if you have more questions. This is going to be changing soon as well. So right now, you obviously, you'll always be able to specify tuple, string, name, yada, yada, yada. Um, the ABI is soon being extended to support struct. So you actually specify struct definitions in your ABI. And then you'd be able to, for example, just say add user takes in a user. And it would do all the rest of the parsing for you. That's still coming. Uh, utilities. So uh, this, this is just a quick slide to kind of show some of the other utilities that are available in ethers. Um, so obviously the ABI coder, like, so these things are all exposed because a lot of tools that aren't necessarily even Ethereum or aren't, aren't dApps can use these to build their own tools. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a language I'm working on and it uses a lot of these just to kind of be more solidity friendly. Um, which is pretty much unrelated to anything that exists today. So there's lots of cool things you do with it. Um, RLP, binary, is, again everything's, uh, yes one quick thing I will mention. Strings, if you're dealing with strings at all in Ethereum, I recommend you use the UTF-8 library in JavaScript. If you have an invalid string, it'll just fix it for you. It'll either replace bytes that don't make sense with a placeholder byte or just strip them entirely. When you're dealing with hashes of things, this, this is not ideal because the hash of these two things is not equal anymore. Um, so this strings library is designed to just throw an exception in the event there's invalid stuff. Um, it's usually an indication somebody's trying to break the system, or, I mean, we're in Japan. Uh, people that might still be running shift JIS as their default encoding. It's nice when things fail before you submit a shift JIS or kind of a big five encoded or whatever um, set of bytes into DNS, which you've now registered a name that you use. I think that's mostly what I want to say about that. I might be done. Oh, no, I'm not done for crap. Okay, four minutes. Command line interface, yes. Um, so there's also a command line interface. Uh, it's a very simple library. It makes it very easy to write your own utilities as command line. Um, so for example, if you're doing your own uh, ERC20 token, you might have a function that allows you to withdraw your funds uh, that you, you've collected from, from users. This allows you to easily make a tool which lets you collect those funds. Uh, so by default, it includes <laughs> sending ether, signing messages, wrapping ether, unwrapping ether. Sweeping is very useful. Um, I'm sure once in a while you've accidentally published a public or private key or information that can be used to derive a public or private key or something to GitHub. This gives you a, the 10 second like quick steal my funds back, and so you can move your funds back into a wallet you control um, before anything takes off with it. Um, it can also run like eval so this allows you to do like bash scripting to do so you can for example resolve ENS names in bash if you wish. Um, I think I'm almost done now. Same sort of thing as this for ENS. There's a massive ENS um, CLI that lets you register names, manage your names, set resolvers. Everything you can do in ENS you can do through the command line. Especially useful if you're like me and keep most of your ENS names on a separate computer that's air gapped going back to the previous uh, offline signing thing. It's a little more work, but it means that my ENS names are less in the wind. Um, yes. And I'm done. And this is some sort of, I don't know what this QR code's for, I guess there's some sort of contest or something. <laughs> so make sure you scan it, because I think you need to do something with it. But oh, That's my spiel, and I think I have two minutes for questions. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, go through first. Um, do you use web worker for encryption? Do I use web worker? Are you are you using web worker for encryption when you're on? The no, because web workers are only for the browser. They yeah, don't. That you can just have a flag. I mean, check if it's if you're in a browser. Right. Process. There's not really a lot of value to it because okay. the encryption is not the slow. You mean like like S script? Yeah. Uh, S script is written entirely custom, so it actually uses coroutines. <coughs> so it doesn't even use web workers to be asynchronous. <coughs> Um, because it's not a, it's not a portable way to be as easier as well. We should absolutely talk about that words if you would like to. Um, um, do you have any plans 
about how to deal with like network changes um, with a like web free provider. Right. Because MetaMask no longer refreshes. Absolutely. So the way I handle that is I have my own custom function which refreshes if the if that stuff changes. Um, but yes, in the meantime, uh, basically the idea is we're going to move one step up. There will be a provider manager which will give you the notifications that a new provider is now being used. Um, because providers have to remain immutable, otherwise weird things happen. And it'll become more important in ETH 2.0 once you start having multiple availability chains. You will actually have to talk to multiple chain IDs at the same time. So it'll become more common to see multiple providers simultaneously. Oh, uh, okay, uh, we'll go to that guy first. Yes. Uh, why, why would I use web3.js instead of ethers? I mean, um, it's politically charged. Um, I, I can let Samuel fill that one for you. I mean, I mean, I like Ethers. I built it because I needed it. I use it. Um, I don't want to badmouth Web3 per se. So we can talk afterwards. In the last <laughs> <laughs> Rather than being on record saying anything. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned uh, fallback providers um, with uh, when you have uh, when you're trying to read, but what about when you're trying to write or send a transaction? Also, writing broadcasts across all of them simultaneously. Okay. Writing costs ether, so it's not really a real attack vector. If someone's paying, oh, is that time's up? Or? One minute left. One minute. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so basically, it's totally safe to broadcast across all of them. Um, in that case, now keep in mind that if you broadcast to five backends the same transaction. Two of them will probably say, okay, got it, but the other three that took a little bit longer are going to say, transaction already seen on network. But that's, in this case, a fine error, and so it returns to the fact that, you know, it was successfully transferred. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I, so earlier you mentioned JavaScript built, built tool chain yes. expertise. Are there any other, like, pressing matters that you can use help with for people who want to contribute to users? Um, I mean, I think the biggest things right now are documentation and building, um, but... I would like to talk to somebody. People don't realize how involved a web software provider is to do in a reliable and scalable way. So it's something that I would like to talk to people and get more feedback on and wouldn't mind getting help with. But um, yes, feel free to bug me afterwards as well to talk to people. Uh, okay, uh, you, you were talking about encryption yes. and password. And you were talking about 10 seconds, but these 10 seconds can be more on different machines. Right, absolutely. And so it's important to realize that your attack vector is, is based, if, if it takes 10 seconds to decrypt your password today, the reason why this is valuable is because that means if an attacker is trying to guess your password, they take 10 seconds of their computer working 100% per guess. Yeah. They want to guess a million things, they have to, but absolutely, next year when computers are twice as fast, um, that five seconds is now five seconds. At some point, the attack vector will become affordable. And so it's also important to realize you should be building new accounts regularly and every so often moving, if you're using memory card, if you're not, if you're just using a mnemonic, it doesn't matter, it's already as insecure as it's going to be. Um, but if you are using memory card, uh, things like this for this purpose, you should absolutely be regularly moving your funds just to um, kind of stay up to date. Um, the other thing I'd recommend is putting things to do with contract wallet that you really care about. Um, but yes, I think, awesome, I think I'm also done. But if there is one more question. Oh, uh, okay. Go for it, Martin. Yes. Does uh, Ethers already or will it support Beth on the signer backend? Uh, oh, Beth? Yeah. No, it does not. It will soon. Beth is definitely on the roadmap. Uh, chain ID was the one thing that I need to bug you with. Yeah. How is your work funded? Uh, so it's, right now, I'm, I'm actually officially part of the EF now. Um, so the EF is like helping keep this thing going. Up until then, the EF provided a few grants. I've received grants from Aon. Um, there's an Aon port of this as well, which I wrote, so that helped fund a lot of this, um, especially the V5 stuff. And Gitcoin. Gitcoin is phenomenal. If you're not unfamiliar with it, become familiar with it. It's freaking awesome. Um, also, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with it, so that's a go off. Thank you.